All right, as we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, big news for this week, you probably already know, we've shipped the uh, PBR, also known as GLTF, materials viewer. Um, so lots of new spiffy graphics are now supported, and that is now the default viewer. Um, this is the second viewer we've put out that's based on the uh, GitHub Actions work, so uh, uh, that part uh, shouldn't have changed, but uh, just the graphics part has. Uh, Dave, do you want to talk any more about uh, the uh, PBR and uh, kind of what's what's on the roadmap there? Sure. So we're doing uh, maintenance fixes right now. Um, it definitely shipped uh, in a, well, how to put it? I want to say it shipped incomplete, but it's definitely not finished. <laughs> Uh, so we're uh, addressing some performance issues that are still lingering. We're and addressing some visual bugs, and some people are, you know, now that it's grid wide, has more eyes on it. Uh, a lot of interesting edge cases are coming up. Um, like Whirly found a really awesome bug with disabling transparent water affects your animations somehow. What? Um, yeah. Uh... <laughs> it wasn't whirly? Okay. I just assume it's whirly because whirly submits so many of the fun bugs. But yes, we, we're definitely following through on, on all of those bug reports. Um, but we shipped because it's in a state where... Uh, the benefits of shipping outweigh the, the drawbacks. Uh, so here we are. But please keep the uh, please keep those bug reports coming and rest assured that we are working on it as fast as we can. Um, the one that I don't really have a good handle on even though uh, Anza has been a huge help on it is the occasional slowdown for some systems, the frequent slowdown um, in the NVIDIA OpenGL drivers. Uh, QA is still working on getting a local repro of that. Yeah. Yeah, that one... Um, it It's... Looks like it has something to do with uh, having a limited number. Well, not a limited number of cores. Having having a sane number of cores, um, and uh, something with multi-threaded GL optimizations. Um, that's the current lead, thanks to Anza. Uh, but until we have a local repro, it's it's hard to tell where a fix might be. So we're just fixing as many performance issues as we can and uh, focusing on the things that we can address quickly. Like today I found an insane bug where, and I don't know how long it's been this way, uh, but we draw the water twice. What? Now you need to find one where you draw everything else twice. And, and what Beck says, uh, it, it's definitely to be taken seriously. And once we have a good handle on what hardware profile can repro it, then we'll probably get one of those systems in the hands of a dev to 
figure out which secret handshake will get the driver to behave. Because it, it's like the, the, the driver just decides to start taking a lot of time in every OpenGL call. Uh, it's not the scene being drawn twice, though the water surface itself gets drawn twice. And it was just a bug with how we were frustum calling water. So once we've got things in an acceptable state on bugs, we do have a bunch of other fun things in the queue for uh, graphics and GLTF, um, but we don't know exactly what order those are going to be coming in or or when because we're waiting on getting the bugs in, a, in an acceptable state first, but we'll uh, be keeping you posted on that. Uh, the exposure adjustments are controllable by sky settings. Uh, it's it's tied to HDR scale that that limits the the range up or down. Um, there are some debug settings for the coefficient, um, and after this sits for a while, and everybody gets used to you know building against. A tone mapper. And then we start might. Then, then we might start introducing uh, controls for um, users to choose which tone mapper, or maybe put that into the sky settings. Um, but while well, everybody's getting used to, oh yeah, tone mapping is a thing. Let's just let's just have the one set of settings. Yeah, and a workaround for a user option. Oh, yeah. Um, and that has to do with the use of a filmic tone mapper instead of something more how to put it, um, like there's Reinhardt tone mapping as a type of tone mapping that, that just crushes everything into a consistent range and then you, where, where you don't need dynamic exposure, but then everything looks like it's the same luminosity. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I, I hear you. It, it, it could definitely use some tuning. Auto exposure is kind of like global illumination. It's never quite done. Uh, there's a disappearing object bug that that we've been working on. Um, and uh, Brad, was there any info you needed on that one? Or do you think you have it under wraps? It's Brad here. I think, yeah. Yeah, I've got it under control. I, I think I've got it under wraps where I've got a repro that is not tied to specific accounts anymore. Uh, so I don't have to be hijacking uh, various uh, special case accounts to do it. Um, but yeah, I've got at least that, that. So there's a, there's a particular cause of objects disappearing uh, when, um, when a particular, when logging in and a particular, way of loading the inventory skeleton 
blocks the main message processing and then the messages for those objects all get dropped. Um, so that was causing objects not to show up. Um, so I've got a fix for that, that uh, I am, uh, well, the fix I had broke a bunch of other things. So I am fixing the fix to not do that, <laughs> um, but it should be going out soon. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's been fun. Um, there is a possibly related thing about certain mesh objects not showing up, which I'm investigating whether or not that's directly tied to it, um, but that may not actually be. So that may be a future fix for that one. So, yeah, I think that's it for that. Um, let's see, Jenna's bug there. What's the status of that internal Jira? Looks like that one is open. Let's see. That has been moved to graphics bugs in general, not PBR specific. Mesh not raising being the same as the disappearing objects bug, we think. So, yeah, I'm looking at those as related. Um, I still need to confirm um, whether my fix fixes both. So, um, so I'm 100% confirmed that they're the same thing, but it's strongly suspected. Is this something that we have a decent repro for? Um. I have not reproed the mesh version of it yet, uh, so I'm going to look at that uh, today. Let's see, do we have any non-PBR news, Ryder, anything new on Simulator Land? Let's see, fall color, uh, PBR is, as, as we said, it's live across the grid. Um, there's a new simulator out on uh, Blue Steel and uh, Blue Steel and Preflight. Um, we have found a bug with regards to collision sounds in that one. Um, so, uh, that's, that's about it. That'll probably be the last simulator for the, uh, uh, for the year. Not sure if we'll be able to sneak out one more viewer release. Um, if we do, I think we're getting close on uh, on emojis, um, but uh, not sure uh, exactly how close. Something I do want to make a note of um, before I forget uh, is 
that uh, third-party viewers can provide tone mapping options. That doesn't technically violate the uh, the shared user experience because they become like post-effect preferences. They don't actually manipulate content or affect how an individual piece of content is displayed. It's it, it, um, and, and they are subjective. Um, but I think it's important, at least for a little while, for the LL viewer to have one set of, uh, well, basically no matter what your preferences are, you get a consistent result in the LL viewer just to sort of set a baseline for artists, artists to build against. Does that make sense? So what's going on with uh, everybody else's viewers? Where are you with PBR support? Um, sounds like Firestorm's firing up a new build. Uh, where's everybody else? Alchemy has had PBR for a few months. we we just kind of been going with it. You've you've got it in your default release at this point. It, it, it's been at our default release for a while. <laughs> oh, nice. Hey, welcome back, Kitty. Haven't seen you for a while. Ooh, that is an excellent question, Coffee. Um, and a can of worms. But the short answer is probably. So that is one of the things that creates a schism. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been talking a bit about that recently. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Send us a if you have a pull request or just want to discuss it. Um, uh, you know, feel free to drop me a line, and and uh, we can we can chat about it. Um, I think it's uh, it's something we might well consider. Yeah, as I understand it, one of the big problems with RLV is the peer-to-peer. -peer. But I don't know a lot about it. Yeah, is that all going through chat and just selectively interpreting stuff that shows up in certain chat channels? Okay. Okay. Because that's one thing that we try to avoid is any kind of peer-to-peer -peer protocol for our privacy reasons. So if it's all just working on hidden chat, Nice on region crossings. Region crossing is a fun problem. So how does RLV work on Firestorm? Is it just an option that you enable, or do you need some kind of adapter or object or something to also make it happen?
Bridge object, that's the question. So, so what's the connection between the feature and the bridge object? Do you have to have that? Yep, that makes sense. So yeah, uh, short answer. Um, let's uh, coffee. Let's talk. If you want to just send a pull request, that's great. If you want to uh, chat about details first, that's that's also great. Yeah, nice thing about the GitHub pull request. So that's a good place to have the conversation. Yeah, in general, it, it'd be really good for everybody if we could reduce the delta between the uh, Linden Lab viewer and third-party viewers. Um, not only would it make merges less painful, it would make the platform more consistent for content developers. RLV is definitely one of those features that creates uh, the feeling of having two different platforms of support for content creators. It's, it's kind of hard to pin down what kind of open source project Second Life is trying to be. Um, so you look at things like Blender, and there's you know the, the common release, and everybody contributes to that one release. And then you look at other things, like uh, I think I think somebody said uh, like Chromium, um, where you have all these disparate forks and people who have skinned it to what their particular browser wants to do. Um, and SL seems to be more like Chromium, but I'm wondering if we want to be more like Blender.
Oh, and yeah, coffee. No trees. One of the things we're getting on the roadmap tentatively is uh, GLTF scene support. Um, so the material support is the first half of the GLTF initiative. The second half is the rest of the spec. Like now we have a path where you can import GLTF scenes sort of uh, by going through Colada for the, the meshes and um, through our GLTF importer for the materials and then touching it up manually uh, on the other side. Um, ideally, we'll get it to where uh, we'll just support the GLTF scene natively. It's definitely a significant change since we just don't have the concept of, uh, of hierarchy built into our current scene graph, if you could even call it a scene graph. Yeah, and in the, in the past when we've talked about adding hierarchy, one of the big hang-ups has been, well, what exactly does that mean? And thankfully the GLTF spec has a pretty good, concise, and unambiguous definition of how to interpret its scene graph. Uh, it renders legacy too. That one's still very much under development, so any anything we would say about that is subject to revision. Right. Um, for LOD generation, um, I don't know if we're going to try to continue to do automatic LOD generation in the importer or just direct people to use Blender to generate their LODs. Um, my thought right now is to look at how SimplyGon interacts with Blender and make sure that our importer can consume what SimplyGon produces. Right, and, and a lot of the, the problems that you get from the SL mesh importer uh, is it doesn't have enough information to actually generate a proxy LOD. Um, like each LOD has to have, has to use the same source material and has to use the same, um, has to have the same number of faces, all this stuff. Uh, where in order to really generate a good LOD, then then you want to be able to say, okay, my high LOD has all these different materials, um, but my low LOD is just like one 256 by 256 uh, material that has a lot of stuff simplified in it and only has one base. Um, and that's the kind of thing you get with, with tools like Simply Gone. Uh, it'll take the whole model and remesh it and generate a new texture for it. Yeah, Nanite is interesting. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking about with UE5 uh, regular LODs.
Right, with GLTF scenes. Um, I'll, I'll need to take a hard look at what Simply Gone does. Uh, but but that's the but the idea is to be compatible with what Simply Gone does. More than eight faces. What's the rule for uh, the the uh, GLTF meshes? There, there's no limit. No limit. Yeah. Um, yeah, the eight faces comes from the fact that underneath the hood, meshes are actually prims in our data model. And so they use the same texture entry data and all that. When we do GLTF sync support, it, it will have to not touch the primitive system in that way. Yeah, so, so limitations that are built into SL that aren't built into GLTF are many. Um, that's one of them. Another one is uh, the 64,000 uh, index limit. I mean, that limit is partly for just don't want to allow too much memory per object, right? I, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to completely remove any limits on that, would we? Uh, you can. Um, it means the object would take longer to load and would have a high, higher um, land impact, so there are natural consequences to, to building that way. Um, yeah, index buffer sizes get bigger. Um, the primary reason that we limited 64K is to keep the index buffer size down. So we use 16-bit indices instead of 32-bit because the, the index buffer is a huge part of the mesh data after you do the fixed point conversion on the floats. So, yeah, as we say, it's a big project. Let's see, more kind of random stuff that I'll throw in. Uh, holiday schedule, we're going to be closed, uh, I think it's the 22nd through the 1st. Um, you know, there will be emergency people on call and all that sort of thing, but uh, in terms of just being able to kind of reach reach people for random discussions, um, we're not going to be uh, not going to be around for the most part. I think the next TPV meeting was supposed to be occurring during that break, and we like pushed it a week later or something. Does anybody else keep searching the marketplace for PBR? Marketplace search is more web team. Yeah. Trying 
trying to remember what the CDN timeout is on Marketplace. Oh, where's Monty when you need him? Uh, writer, any thoughts on HTTP2? Uh, I'd like to get, I'd like to get it in. Um, Jenna, do you mean HTTP2 to the simulator or to the asset store? To the asset store would be nice. Yeah, that would be that would be very nice, and I've got a a particular hobby horse I've been beating for years. Um, that is, yeah, that's something I've, I've been wanting for years. Um, unfortunate, un, unfortunately, uh, it's the, the group that, that handles that has not done it. Um, so yeah, it's a little outside. It's a little outside my uh, my area, or my. my, uh, my I know we have something on the schedule. Well, not, no, we don't have it on the schedule. We have it on the list of things we'd like to do f to get HTTP two into the viewers uh, into the viewers uh, curl usage. Well, um, yeah, it it needs to be done since since pipelining uh, is is removed from the later versions of curl yeah so so the the version of curl that the viewer is stuck on uh, can't advance until that happens well this sounds like something we need to fix this year by this year I mean <laughs> Sounds optimistic this year. <laughs> and yeah, what, what Joe says, it's... Um, I, I, yeah, I'm kind of confused where, where the where the hang-up is, because... Uh, It is Akamai's, you know, indexing and caching system for the CDN getting forwarded to a root node. Uh, well, there's definitely viewer work needed to support it. Uh, I'm not sure if there's other piece of the puzzle too. Yeah, but but I'm I'm kind of confused. What, like, why the viewer wouldn't just start be able to start using HTTP2 now? Um, because somebody needs to check a box on the Akami configuration to actually enable it. They don't enable it by default. Yeah, I'm kind of confused as to why. And I have, I think I have that password. Um, and we have, we're running with a very old version of curl. Needs to be updated. Well, yeah, but the, but the viewer can... Um, you don't have to use curl to do any HTTP requests. Well, in any case, you know, there'll be viewer changes to either update curl or do something else instead. Yeah. But yeah, if we flip the, uh, if we enable it, like Rice said, on the Akamai config, um, that would at least unblock people to start experimenting with it. And I don't, but we'd have to make sure that there's not some kind of infrastructure reason that I don't know about for not enabling it.
Well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I, I, I don't think... It would just fall back to HTTP 1. Right. Like, like at the Akamai level, that you should be able to support both on the same uh, endpoint. It'll it'll fall back to HT uh, to HTTP one. Uh, I'll wait till the holiday break and then check the box. Oh boy. Yeah, Beck, we will have uh I mean we have a we have a thirty two bit stub cohort already. Um not sure if we would have any incentive to I, I don't think we even can update it because it's the uh, pre GitHub actions universe. But we'll you know, we'll keep it around. People should be getting pushed into it automatically, but there's not a, it's not actually listed on the alternate viewers page, so we're going to try to get that actually someplace visible too. has me googling sonic.net is it a bot that was logged in for the entire month wow windows xp i i swear a lot of those are people like running the viewer in compatibility mode. On Windows 8 or 10. I mean, I do that sometimes.
Must be somebody running on a Raspberry Pi. That was in the forums. Somebody uh, on a Pi 4. Henry has a Pi port of cool VL, I think, too. Yeah, he was he was in the forum thread. Uh, I'm great if I wish I had a link to it. It really went off the rails. Maybe running SL is the new running Doom. <laughs> Run SL on a lot more. as an apt get install second life. Yeah, voice on Linux would be a fun problem. This is voice on Linux right now. Native voice on Linux that doesn't use the ancient binary and has the current protocol and does not require wine. No, 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 real voice. A real voice, not voice running through Windows on Linux with hopes and dreams connected to the audio server with even more hopes and dreams. I think there's some chewing gum in there, too. Probably. Fair amount of duct tape. It, it is wine. It runs on hope. Yes, if you're if you're interested in voice stuff, uh, you might talk to Roxy. Because I'm sure she'd love to talk to anybody about voice. Yeah, I hear you, Coffee. Um, it does work with uh, the Windows real-time um, captioning. And I, I, and I kind of rely on that sometimes to tell what people are saying. Oh, it wasn't sarcasm. Um, Roxy, Roxy was at High Fidelity and has lots of insight and 
opinions about the boys. Place Vivox with something better? Something with half the chewing gum. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to say anything out of turn. The voice question is something that comes up every now and again. Uh, asking for something better, it sounds like one definition of better is works on Linux. Are there other particular things you'd be looking for in a, in a different voice provider? Yeah, the spatial audio thing, it's good in theory with attenuation so that you know the people near you are louder and the people behind you are 
you know people elsewhere software software but without without acoustics and ambisonics it still sounds like the people behind you are in front of you and yeah it takes concentration Yeah, you're talking about Jenna. You're talking about automatic gain control. Wasn't well, automatic uh, gain control the reason that the like, voice barely worked at all for years, and then we finally changed the setting and it worked a lot better? Um, I don't recall that, but I do know that good automatic gain control is very hard. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there was an issue with the uh, default gain control that was causing people to uh, complain much more vociferously about voice than they uh, they do now. Gain control setting, yeah, maybe that was it. Uh, anyway, I guess we're about at time. Thanks for coming by, everybody, and play with PBR and let us know what you think, and we will talk to you, I think, uh, early January sometime. I'll definitely let folks who are interested in the problem know that folks here are interested in talking about voice. Yep. Yep. Great holidays, all. See folks on Discord, and uh, Merry Christmas.